A firm is regarded as a natural monopoly when it is the sole owner of the essential infrastructure required to distribute a good or service to the consumer. Industries where infrastructure is necessary include electricity, which uses grids and cables, gas and water supply, which uses pipelines, and railway transport, which depends upon networks of tracks and stations. The need for infrastructure means that the natural monopolist faces significant fixed costs. In order to cover these fixed costs, production must be on a large scale, and this means that, typically, natural monopolies can benefit from economies of scale. This also means that long-run average costs of supply continue to fall as output increases. As average costs fall, marginal costs must be below average cost over the normal range of output. For a natural monopolist, there is a considerable advantage in being the first firm in the market. As a firm builds up its infrastructure by laying more pipelines or cables, it can exert increasing control over the market and the whole industry, making it difficult for new firms to enter. For a natural monopolist faced with significant economies of scale, minimum efficient scale, which is the lowest output necessary to minimise average costs, may only be reached when the firm's market share is a significant proportion of the total market size. Once the first firm into the market reaches minimum efficient scale, having exploited all available economies of scale, it becomes difficult for new entrants to compete and access to the market is denied. The door is, effectively, slammed shut. In fact, if the existing monopolist reaches minimum efficient scale at a market share of 51%, then only one firm can exist. Natural monopolies are, therefore, characterised by considerable barriers to entry. The most significant barriers arise from the economies of scale that are available to the incumbent firms. So, what are the regulator's options? If regulators do not intervene, then a privately owned natural monopoly is likely to adopt a profit-maximising strategy. This means producing and supplying up to the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Here, we can see that the profit is maximised at output Q, with price at P. Supernormal profits are represented by the area P, A, B, C. Profit maximisation may also conflict with ethical and environmental objectives. The negative environmental effects of production and supply may be significant in many industries, especially energy production. Natural monopolists may also operate inefficiently, with suboptimal levels of both allocative and productive efficiency. Despite these inefficiencies, economic theory clearly suggests that artificially creating more competition by encouraging new entrants would do nothing other than lead to a wasteful duplication of the supply infrastructure. Is society really better off with two identical water supplying firms or two national grids? Hence, the case for intervention is strong. Given that natural monopolies are powerful and may gain control of key utilities such as water and energy, the default view in the early 20th century was that ownership should be brought under the control of the state through nationalisation. Indeed, most key industries in the UK and across Europe came under the control of the state. For example, in 1926, the National Electricity Grid was established, and later in 1947, over 500 independent electricity suppliers were nationalised. Similarly, coal was nationalised in 1947, and gas a year later. As nationalised companies became the subject of considerable criticism as a result of inefficiency, lack of management expertise and over-reliance on taxpayer support, the consensus view was that the state should divest itself of the public utilities. Widespread privatisation during the 1980s and 1990s returned these natural monopolies to the private sector. However, given that they remained natural monopolies, the need for regulation became apparent. Each privatised industry was allocated an individual regulator to ensure companies operated with regard to consumer interests. For example, water privatisation in 1989 was accompanied by the establishment of the water regulator Ofwat. Natural monopolies can also be broken up, as in the case of British Telecom, which was broken into BT and Openreach, which maintains the telecom's infrastructure. Similar breakups occur with railways and energy supply. With railways, the UK government established Network Rail as the infrastructure owner and provider of services to the UK's train operating companies, TOCs, who bid for the franchise to operate certain routes. Similarly, regulators can also force suppliers to unbundle their infrastructure to enable new firms to enter.
In the case of rail, telecoms and energy supply, owners of the infrastructure can be ordered to allow rival firms to supply services using this infrastructure. Other tactics to keep the natural monopolist operating with some regard to consumers is to manipulate price through price capping. One method involved the use of the RPIX formula to set prices. In this case, price is allowed to reflect the ongoing inflation rate, but is constrained by the value of X, which is an estimate of the efficiency gain that would exist if the market was competitive. So, if X is set at 5% and the RPI is 3%, the formula becomes 3 minus 5 equals minus 2. So, the regulated firm would have to reduce price by 2%. The danger of setting a low price to achieve allocative efficiency is that it forces the firm to make a loss. A less strict approach involves setting pricing rules or guidelines. In the case of pricing, the regulator is acting as a surrogate competitor, forcing the natural monopolist to alter its decision-making, as would happen if a real competitor existed. What is clear is that natural monopolies present regulators with a dilemma. While they are potentially harmful, increasing competition could be wasteful, leaving regulators with the role of surrogate competitor and to develop strategies to minimise harmful behaviour and maximise social efficiency. To see more videos, go to www.economicsonline.co.uk.